Good morning. It's hard to see with the glare. Oh my goodness. How are you? So today is Saturday and normally on Saturday I uh, do an online sort of a live meditation at four o'clock. Um, so I'm just hopefully this is going to just be a quick message to let you know that um, today I will be on the tail end of an all day workshop at four. So uh, it's early morning, still taking my my morning java and I'm um, getting ready for the day. It's a workshop that um, is all about shifting your thought process and, um, you know, of course you, you pay money to go to this and then he apparently will just talk to you about taking everything that's bad and nasty and you'll end up at the end of the day having shifted all of your horrible nasty thoughts and you'll be on your way to making mega wonderful things happening in your life. So, um, <laughs> it sounds it sounds like a great way to socialize with some like-minded people who want to stay positive. So, feet on my ground. Um, uh, I'm going to this, this workshop, but that means that I won't be here for the 4 o'clock meditation today. Um, so I just wanted to let you know, I mean, there's like barely one or two people that actually attend, um, which is fine. I mean, it's doing. I'm doing something on my channel that I really love doing, that I would be doing anyways otherwise. And, um, you know, maybe people watch it afterwards. So, <clears throat> but today I won't be doing it. Um, I will likely be doing something this evening. Um, I don't know if it's going to be live or whatever. And also tomorrow, the plan is to travel and see Winnie and uh, do a one o'clock live. Um, so I'm going to confirm that hopefully today with her. She's, I mean, it was, we were planning to do it last week. So um, I asked her to talk about dream catchers because on my channel at some point um, I had offered that. There weren't any kind of comments about it expressing interest, but I know that it's something that is of interest to me. And, uh, and I think, I think uh, it'll be really good to have um, some information from a veritable source. So, uh, yeah, that's the plan. That's the plan. Sometimes plans have a way of, woohoo, you know, doing things. So we'll go with the plan. We'll, we'll aim to be here tomorrow at one and this evening. <clears throat> so that's my message. If that's, um, just the update you want, then you got it. Um, I'm going to end though just by giving you a little bit of a taste of what I've been doing creatively this week. I haven't been much online. I've been feeling kind of very mellow and not wanting to do much. So I go with it. Um, I have the kind of job that allows me to do that. I can do kind of like the bare minimum, which is already a lot of work. But I've designed my life to do a job that is actually um, nourishing to me. I work in daycare, so I'm able to do a lot of creative work. And uh, with the children doing their creative work, which is multimedia, sort of art and that sort of thing, and we can do um, all the lesson planning and everything, including, you know, art. Um, so that's how I've been kind of really feeding my soul um, and doing that this week. The more meticulous parts I do when I'm on my own, um, you know, like when it's including the, the flame, that sort of thing. I'll show you what I what I did. Um, the first thing I did, well, actually, it probably took this past month. This owl I finished yesterday. This is a multimedia, although it doesn't really quite look like it. Uh, this is a picture out of a coloring book. Which I just happen to have here. This coloring book. Uh, I love these adult coloring books. This particular one focuses on animals, and I'm, I'm partial to animals. So there's some paint on here, like acrylic paint, and a lot of uh, pencil and um, felt pens of various sorts. So I don't know if you want to call that multimedia. It's, it is technically, but it's still, still everything is all pencil. And I did the same thing here. So there is an elk because I had done um, a talk on my channel about the elk. And so uh, I did a picture to kind of go with that, and that'll be in my book, in my journal. So what I want to show you, um, I think what I'll do is I'll do a proper sort of a flip through of this, one of my ginormous sort of, this is probably my favorite BOS type books, um, you know, 
it's, it's kind of big and bulky. So I'm going to set myself up to maybe do that this evening or sometime soon. But um, I will show you what I have been doing, which is, if I can sort of picture this for you, um, I'll take like a paint. Okay, everything, first of all, is in a plastic sleeve. Um, and the reason being is, of course, it makes it easier to sort of flip through the pages without damaging the pages. It also makes it easier for me to toss in any notes that I want because pretty much every page is always uh, under construction, <laughs> under destruction, under construction, whatever. It's all the same thing here. Um, and there's always the, the question of do you use a, a binder so that you can put things and insert them into the, where you want them and shift the things around. Um, if you screw them into the binding with a great big sexy book, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of effort to sort of do that a little bit more work than, say, a three ring binder. Of course, a three ring binder is always plastic and metal and very machine like industrial looking and not very, you know, authentic from way back in the time of once upon a time when grimoires and things were being hidden from sight. So um, I always kind of wonder do I want to bind my book or not? Um, so I tend to use books kind of like, you know, I've shown this one before. This one, this is my kind of my chakra type book, which I'm constantly working in. Um, but uh, and those are kind of bound-ish. I mean, there's a perforated line down down the middle, so that or down the side, so that you can sort of take it out. But I just kind of figure I'm gonna leave a note somewhere in my will or whatever that um, you know you can gather all the books and keep them as is if you want to share them because I have two girls and they would primarily go to them. Um, my artwork may not mean as much as it does to, you know, it, it might mean more to me than it does to anyone else. So I don't know if it's going to be a great big, you know, a valuable thing to pass through the centuries, really. It's, it's kind of a lot of stuff that I've glued together. And I don't know how, how, I mean, who knows? It might fall into the hands of somebody who will just, like, pitch it. <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen after I'm gone, but I, I have, you know, I have hopes and aspirations as to what's going to happen with all this work. At the very least, um, I'll have made videos that feature them, and so in that way, it'll, you know, it'll be somewhere in time. Um, but with regard to the binding, I mean, after my physical death, uh, obviously, it can be bound after I'm gone, because then you know, the physical life is complete, it can be bound, you know, assemble everything and then you'll have a book that's about like, you know, 10 feet wide, or you can assemble it in which way you want and bind a bunch of them, or just keep them as is. But, um, so I'm kind of done with, you know, arguing about that sort of thing in my mind right now. I just sort of like, I, I don't limit myself as to um, how it should sort of be bound or not bound or the binder or the authenticity of how it looks because um, yeah it's just a lot of turmoil and it stops me from getting the work done it stops me from getting the art therapy done which I like to have um, the other idea is about authenticity um, you know we like to make it old I think it's really cool and aesthetically pleasing I I love the the type of stuff like um, of course the the Practical ma Magic, the uh, Book of Shadows in Charmed, that sort of thing. But the authenticity of it, um, I mean, I, I think about things probably a little bit more than I should, but, you know, in dissecting that very idea, um, the people from one, two, three, five hundred years ago or whatever, when they were making their books, their books of shadows, they had very limited resources. Um, so we are not going to be doing the same things as they did back then. I mean, paper was hard to come by. A pen was hard to come by back then. So um, the reason why they had this big book of shadows, if it actually was a big book of shadows that was being passed down the centuries, is because you had, you know, a multitude of people generationally who were probably creating a couple of pages over the course of their lifetime. And, um, and that's it. And then they add that to the book. And so you end up with a big book because... Um, every one person would put a few things in. And um, so so making a great big book of shadows like we do today is not authentic in that kind of a process because um, because just we can do more with because we have more at our fingertips. Everybody does. It's just a different world. So I don't really fuss too much about whether I want to put, you know, if I if I want to put stickers in them like this, 
you know, or feathers. Um, it's it's just it's just something that is at our fingertips that they wouldn't have had back then. So there's that about authenticity. It's just not. It's going to be authentic to. We use what we have at our time. They used what they had at their time. We use what we have at our time. So the books are going to be different. Um, they had uh, a number of people creating any that one book. We are one person creating, you know, the same size book or larger or many books. And um, it, it's just it's just the process is different. So I don't let the authenticity part of it kind of um, hinder me, although I wish I could make a book of shadows like um, like in Practical Magic because that one's kind of cool. Although I don't want to kill a bird. <laughs> I just wouldn't do that spell. I just wouldn't. I couldn't. <laughs> um, what's the other thing about authenticity? Oh, yeah. Um, today we have information that's at our disposal, too. I mean, I remember not so long ago, as I was living through the 70s and 80s, um, computer and the like, internet was not what it was. So what it is, what it is now. So essentially, um, the information that you have... Uh, at our fingertips. I mean, if I want to look something up about um, Asian, Asian spirituality, anything, you know, Indian, China, if I want to look up Feng Shui, if I want to look up who's Vishnu, if I want to look up um, the Mala Beads, anything at all, um, it's at my fingertips. Uh, so that'll show up in my book of shadows, chakras. If I want to look up, I mean, I don't really kind of look at anything much of the um, African sort of persuasion on that continent, um, but I could, you could, and uh, there's voodoo and hoodoo and the history of Christianity with, like, everything is just at our disposal. So that really kind of thickens up our books, too, whereas um, that wouldn't have been kind of authentic to the time, to the period, because being able, the average person wasn't able to sort of connect and have information from anywhere else other than their neighboring region, unless somebody came and brought stories from someplace else. So um, our books of shadows are really very different uh, today than they used to be um, once upon a time. So we do sort of want to make it look vintage, and that's I think that's eye candy. That's something that we really like. Um, I certainly do. I mean, if you look behind me, Everything's secondhand. Everything's pre-owned. Everything is. Um, I just love the spirit of having things that have been pre-loved, you know, and bring a history with them. Um, I love vi vintage and shabby chic, and I always have. Uh, I love decorating with doilies and that sort of thing that carry a history with it. Um, so that definitely is something that is attracting to me. And I think a lot of people really like the sort of the historical significance of feeling like you're looking through something in history. So that part of it is really cool, but I don't think it's, it's really, I mean, the messages basically that I'm giving is don't let anything like stop you. If you want to make it look like it's, you know, part of history, that's cool. But I mean, we have technology today to, to kind of carbon date and, you know, it's really going to be an aesthetic. It's not going to be authentic, like, ever. <laughs> so um, have fun with it. Have fun and do what you want. I mean, if you want to put, like, crayons and any kind of new inventions like stickers um, that wouldn't have been available back in the day, then knock yourself out, man. Knock yourself out. So what I've been doing this week is um, I'm just going to share a little technique that is really not a big revelation, but it's just something that I did. And I'm going to close with this because I have to kind of get ready and get off to my workshop. But <clears throat> so what I did was, what was I working with? Um, oh, I found some references on the ethics of magic, uh, which I'm rather particular to. I put basics on. Um, if I'm going to do some kind of an elaboration on it, I'll, I'll do that a little bit later. You'll notice my voice is a little raspy this morning because I'm just trying to get this video out. Um, oh, I shouldn't make it very long because I have to download it before I leave. Ah, okay. All right. Um, and this one. So I talked about the sympathetic magic um, and then the petitioner. So here is what I did here. And essentially what it is. Oh. 
plastic plastic I'll fix that later so the first thing I did and I, I did a lot of this kind of with uh, daycare um, kids so they're painting their stuff and I'm painting my stuff and I'm modeling you know the behavior and I'm there and we're around the table and all doing the same stuff but I'm kind of doing two things at once um, I'm also sort of preparing my pages which for them what they see is I'm putting paint on a page which is super cool so these are um, acrylic paints and I was just sort of smooshing them around. Now these pages are not done by any means because the way I do it is I layer and then layer and then I come back and I layer and then so I just did a whole bunch of these pages um, with different techniques like different paint colors front and back. So there's gold. Is that gold? Oh that one's not done yet. That's white. Um, this one's orange. So it's a nice bright orange. Orange. There you go. Anyway, you know what orange looks like. It's orange. And then we have um, a mix of gold and green. So you see, you just kind of smoosh the colors around. The back of that page is white. This series here of like gold, I'm going to uh, redo the little section of rooms that I have somewhere because sometimes I like to redo things, right? So these ones here are all just gold. And I really love the acrylic gold paint that I have. It looks, it's so smooth. And so then I try a little bit of border on this. So essentially what that is, is, you know, you do, you do the base of it. And then here, I'll take this one out of its thing. Somehow this pouch is going to be involved into this one. I don't exactly know how it's going to happen, but this page um, looked really sad when it first started. This is one of these cheap dollar store stamps. Um, I don't recommend them. They're like the flat, do I have it close by? They're like the flat, um, I mean, you have to have a bag of art supplies at every, at every turn, right? So, um, yeah, it's the ones that come in this. Oh man, they're flat, they don't have like a handle on them. Here, I bought two of them. This is exactly it, but this is the birdcage version of it. So they're, they're very um, flat sort of rubber stamps that give you this and they're embossed. So they give you these inks, these ink pads, so that you can sort of layer it. And eventually on the back, you see how you put different layers and eventually you end up getting um, the image. So you start with a bird and then you add that and you add that and you add the cage and you get the thing. So the ink itself, because I had put it on top of uh, acrylic paint, took forever to dry. Yeah, it was like oily and, um, and then the, the image of the, the, it's not a precise, it's not an exact science. So that's as good as it'll get. And I'm, I mean, messy is nice, and if I like messy, that's good, but it's missing something. So I'm going to see if I can go in afterwards with a felt pen and sort of do some details that just to sort of make it pop a bit and make it pretty. The um, the brown bits on it is tea bag. I was drinking, you know, tea, and I just took the tea bag, and I was going to start using the tea bag itself as like a, uh, like a paintbrush, but I didn't. What I did was I opened it up, and I took some glue mixed it up with some glitter paint and um, the tea, some tea leaves. And then I just smeared the tea leaves here and there on there. So there's an idea for you if you like. This is a partial stencil. I didn't do the whole stencil because it would take up the whole page, but I did a corner of it. And then I decided um, I was working with, um, you know, like witches knots and um, braids. Um, I forget the term that was used in that particular book, but anyways, braids were involved. And so I ended up doing one. So that's in preparation. And so, um, you know, having a little tuck thing, I just glued it on the sides of the picture. And so that's going to be a tool. Uh, and that's kind of where I put it away. So the, the end result is this. It has a little bit of a framing, sort of a... And I don't know if it's done yet. But anyway, and then this is the, the back of that page. With, again, stenciling. Stenciling is really cool for somebody like me who... Oh, and then, yeah, this is going to be involved as well. So I think I'm going to create some sort of a a prayer, um, a spell for people who speak the language, but, you know, for people who are afraid of 
religions other than their own, then, you know, we'll call it a prayer. Whatever. Um, so what I want to show you is this burning. Uh, basically, what I did was I took a candle because what happens is you have uh, the back of the page that how do you write on this? You got like solid, like serious color on there, and how do you write on it and keep your line straight? Because at this point, you can't sort of draw lines. Um, I'll show you down in the back of my book. You know how you draw lines with with pencil like this. You draw lines with pencil down, and then you um, you write to make it all nice and straight. Um, that takes a lot of time. It really does. I mean, you you go through um, all of these bits, and you, you do page after page uh, of this line drawing, and then you have to, or you could, erase them. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But I was trying to find kind of like, you know, a different way. So by doing this uh, on the back and taking tracing paper, just a simple tracing paper like this, you know, whatever tracing paper is readily available at the dollar store. Um, you take it, you put it on. Oh, I just got a message. So she's confirming for tomorrow for the Dreamcatcher um, interview. So you just put a line, a rule page of some sort behind and trace paper. And then you have, if you can see right through, I think you can see that right through. Then you have, you don't have to draw lines. You don't have to measure it and center it on your page or anything. It's kind of like a way that you can write information down without having to draw all the lines, right? So that's a, a really, it's a shortcut that I've just started, that I've been thinking about for a long time. The end result will end up looking like this, okay? So here's Ethics of Magic, so the Ethics of Magic, and I didn't draw the lines on here, I just did the trace paper technique. Um, and then what I did is I found the place that I wanted to glue it, I made sure that I burnt around the edges, and now when you're burning trace paper you have to be really particular about it because it burns really quickly. So I use a very tiny candle, a very tiny flame, I, um, I elevate it close by so that I can really have control over the least little bit. I have my, I have a very large cauldron. It's actually like a camping, they call it camping Dutch oven. So it's a very large, so if ever there's a problem, I can just drop this stuff in there and that's it. And there's always a fire extinguisher close by. Um, but you want to make sure that the edges are really, um, you know, you are measured out before you get there. Give yourself some extra so that you know what you're going to be writing and you're measuring it out before you actually glue it on. So you can see a bit of the color underneath. Um, and when you have two different colors underneath, the page might disappear. You see some of the colors that are changing underneath. You see very vaguely what happens. But what it does is that it gives you a different way to, to mix up the medium, the media, like the, the, the materials that you use. And most of all, you don't have to do a lot of measuring and ruler kind of work, which can be very meditative. But I mean, everything I do is freaking meditative. And after a while, it's like, I'm all meditated out. Like, I just want to get this stuff done. So, <laughs> and I know you can relate. So this is, um, this is the way it turns out, you know, something like this. And this kind of page is probably not um, finished. I mean, at some point, it'll be more. But this is like purple and gold with some stenciled, Sort of, and when you're doing stenciling, make sure that your brush has sort of got the paint on it, but very dry, so that when you do the edges, they don't bleed. Um, I can probably show you a picture of some edges that have bled, but anyways, you know how they bleed on the side, and then you don't get a clean sort of edge on your on your stencil. And you don't want that when you're actually doing um, your art because you know starting over is not always what you want to do. Okay, so. Burning the edges, trace paper, that way we won't have to continue using ruler unless you want to. Uh, obviously. Is there anything else that I want to share with you? I just wanted to do a two minute video and say that I'm not going to be here at four. Um, so I'm going to romp through my, uh, my journal, my BOS, my whatever you want to call it. Um, 
talking about the ethics of magic, um, you know, some of that was was basically, I mean, you're doing art, but you're also sort of like really kind of clarifying what you want in your book. And in doing that, you can read like 14 pages and kind of reduce it into a paragraph and see what what is important to you. Um, I do kind of think about what I want to leave behind, but at the same time, I want to say what's specific to to me, you know, personally. Um, with regard to the ethics of magic, it was really kind of talking about freedom. So, of course, I put, you know, butterflies flying. Um, but basically, it was talking about a bit of a conundrum because what I came across was um, you want to kind of create your your spell working, your magical, your incantation, your, your prayer, your whatever, your intention. Um, for the person who uh, is going to be affected by the magic. And that person, ideally, would be yourself. So the person who wants the work done for them, for, for them should be the person to, that would best, the best, the magic would, uh, is more powerful when you're doing it for yourself. Um, when you're doing it for somebody else, you don't have the invested interest uh, in the outcome of their life as much as they do. So if they don't get the job, if they don't get the love interest, or they don't get the whatever, um, you don't have the same kind of passion. You don't have to live with the results of not having uh, that that magic, you know, come to fruition. So that, that very energy, that very passion, that very intention um, is lacking in a practitioner um, working for somebody else. So that's just with the, the information that I was coming across, um, ideally, I think in that situation, I would teach the other person how to do it for themselves in a simpler version, so that it's you know they can they can do it easily with the minimal amount of time and effort and materials. Um, yeah, but ethically, uh, you'd always have to ask permission uh, to do something for somebody else because there's always the question of a love a love spell. Right, so you're doing it um, something towards somebody else. Um, does that person actually want to be manipulated and drawn back into a relationship? There may be some reasons why that person doesn't want to be in. So if you're putting some energy into um, drawing somebody else towards, you know, drawing person B towards person A, um, whether person A is you or not, then you're sort of putting a manipulation. You're um, imposing something on someone else, and so then do they have choice? In the matter, do they have free will in the matter? Um, are you taking their situation into consideration? So those are sort of the things that I was reading about in terms of the ethics of magic. Um, so you always have to kind of consider that, you know, what would it be like to be the other person having that on them, those intentions on them? So ideally, a spell like that, you might want to consider saying something like drawing the best love into your life, whoever that may be, the person who you would like intending, or another person. So drawing love into your life as opposed to specifically um, sending that energy towards one person specifically because that is the manipulation. Then it talked about, you know, ethically, when you are um, inadvertently manipulating uh, energy for a healing um, where the person may or may not be able to give their consent uh, because they are in dire need of healing. So um, that, that's kind of like the, what, all the stuff that I was reading about and then reduced it into like a very small paragraph. So, uh, what I said was always ask permission to do magic, respect someone's choice, um, or the subject's choice. Consider how you would think or feel in their position. Manipulation may be unavoidable in the case of healing. If it harms someone or disrespects their own free will, it is negative or it's low energy or a low vibration magic. Um, I try to stay away from words like black magic because the color black is, um, the, 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 um, the interpretation of colors is different across cultures. It's different across time. Um, so I'm not really kind of talking about black magic, but I, I refer to it as low vibrational. And you want to kind of try and keep your vibration high, right? Um, always use careful consideration before planning and executing, ex executing, executing, um, magical spells, executing, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I got the accent on the wrong syllable there, you know, sorry about that. Okay. So that's my little summary for that. For that, um, 
Is there anything else? Yeah. So, there's your video. <laughs> there's my video for the day. Um, like I said, I'll try and uh, come back this evening. I'll probably be so um, inspired that I'll have a zillion things to say. Um, or I may be so internally, like just so processing information by this full day, uh, this workshop that I'm going to, that who knows, maybe I won't want to do um, a video this evening because I might want to make it just kind of simmer for a while. But uh, because sometimes you have to do that, right? It's, you have to sort of like let it simmer and sort of tease out in the universe what it is that you, what makes sense and yeah. So I'll see you for sure tomorrow, one o'clock here for the live on Dreamcatchers with Winnie. And uh, that's it for now. I won't be here for the four o'clock meditation this afternoon. Take care. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.